think I need the word more today than giving the word. There's something that I understand that I said two people got up and they went to the same place. And that's a restaurant. The one sit down to be served and the other one served. I don't know which one is greater. But I think Jesus Christ said, the one that served. Amen. So uh, I thank the leadership of so of the word to afford us this opportunity. I always speak of us. That's how lawyers speak. Uh, it's not great circumstances which I find myself in Cape Town. We came to lay down to rest the nephew, the tragedy now. But I know that there is a price that has been paid. And I always try to pitch it as follows. You are sitting, not even facing the door, where Jesus is transacting on your behalf. And he's so confident, confident in doing that. And the person he's doing it with says, but who are you paying this price for? Because that person is not even looking. But it is what the Bible talks about, a quiet confidence that he has. in just forging on with the transaction. And when he's done, he just walks on in belief. And while you are dead in your transgression, at one stage you awaken up from that. And then when you come to this door, it's like an automatic door and the door just opens for you. Yes. Amen. Amen. I want to just talk a little bit about our father Abram, when he was still Abram. In Genesis 12, there's one. There's an instruction given to him. I know that some of us had received certain callings to come into the ministry. But I want, and I'm going to try to portray a calling and see how far we are apart from then and now. Hallelujah. Let's see if we succeed. In Genesis 12, verse 1, the Lord says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Father, I thank you. It is thee that will minister to your people. You will give me, O Father God, a skilled ear and a learned tongue. I'm only a vessel, but as I open my lips, let your grace drop me, Father, and let it flow into the heart and hearts of your people, O Father. Every crevices, as they open, O Father, my open of my life, my mind, and my heart to receive Thee. So come and permeate and saturate this place of God in our Word. And you will open up doors, O Father, that have been closed. You will show us, O Father, that we will just not admire the door, but we will open the door to go beyond the door to see what you have prepared for us, O God. And for that, we thank you, O Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now I've got one of these habits that I read and then from there I don't go back to the Word. Because there will come a time that the Bibles will be no more. We, we, we become so dependent on the Bible, but actually we have to become the Word. We keep the Bible and we say this is the Word of God, and but when I put it behind me, then there's nothing in me 
to show that I am actually the true representative of what Hebrews are talking about, that we should become that word. Now, if you take the account of Abraham, a foreigner, total foreigner, An ear that is not in frequency with the Word of God. Somewhere tending to make the business of his, of his dad. And a voice speaks unto him. Maybe in a language that he also doesn't understand. Is this really for me? Is this voice speaking to me? And the instruction is, on three accounts, he must apply the principle of separation. S separate yourself from your country. And separate yourself from your fellow countrymen. And then lastly, separate yourself from your father's house. That is an extensive requirement. For any man. It will bring you to your knees. This morning I want you to think when the Lord says separate you from your country means separate you from your body. And then separate you from your country means separate yourself from your soul. And separate yourself from your father's house is separating yourself from your spirit. In other words, everything that you knew before the calling of God, you need to separate yourself from. You know when we get married, he said that the man must leave. So what is so different about Abraham's calling? Leave your father and your mother. Or leave your mother and your father. I don't know why they always say the mother first in those instances. Leave your mother and your father. So leave to cleave. Some people can't leave properly, so they can't cleave properly. They cannot unite because that one hand is still there by mommy. So this is the greatest calling that is happening. You must leave everything that you have known. Separate yourself. In other words, sanctify yourself for what I am about to teach you. Now we know that Abraham still took some of his countrymen with him, his nephew, Locked, we, 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 we know that they come. So he made some mistakes. And then he goes to a place, because now, remember God says, I will, I will I take you from this place, and I'll take you to another place. But the thing is, removing him from one place means that he's now displaced. Is not where he's supposed to be. He's displaced because I need to replace something. But the ultimate move is to take him from a place. And this is where we get stuck. We take him from a place because I want to make you a person. For too many times we look in and we're getting used to a place. Jesus had to send his son so that we can embrace the person. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So now the transition for Abraham is a very difficult transition. Because the, the economy, in God's economy, there's something that he used as a mode of transaction. Today we call it faith. But then it was obedience. We know that the Bible says that obedience is better than sacrifice. But look at Abraham. Why is Abraham in Genesis 12 
as he's going, and I, 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 I'm actually, actually I actually wrote a book about this, and I call it a nice word, I didn't say spiritual contract, I call it spiritual indenture, which is also meaning contract, but we just want it to be. It's kind of clever. But what it is, the spiritual contract that God is entering into with Abram, he says to him that I will bless you. And I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you. So that is the reward that I will give you. So he hasn't moved yet, but he knows what's the, re the reward. And sometimes in our life it's the same thing. So now Abram, as he's going with his father, and the father we know dies on his way in a place called Haram. But he dies in Haram because his son, one of his sons that died was also called Haram. So you see familiarity cripples us. We die sometimes when we come into places that we love. And then we thought, but like we say that we have arrived. But it's not God's purpose. Many other plans in the man's are, but it's not. It's only the purpose of God that prevails. We know what Proverbs tells us. So now it happens, the father dies, and all of a sudden there's a said, now he can, he's ready to separate. But in his separation from the father, he takes with him all of that stuff. His hurt, anxiety, despair, he takes it with him. So now the voice of God is somehow hampered. It's not so clear. But God says to him, you must go to a place. And then for some reason, he ends up in Egypt. I don't know why do they all end up in Egypt. But when you are at the place where God doesn't want you, God never speaks to you. He speaks through your circumstances. Your circumstances come to tell you now, why didn't you say that this is your wife? What did you want to do? What did you want to happen to, it to happen to me? Why is it that you didn't? We come into circumstances and we say, this is my sister when it's my wife. You know, the old, old teacher uh, uh, acquaintances of the church was always not introduced as my wife, as my sister. No, she's your wife. Let's learn from Father Abraham. He made the mistake. And then the second one, when he went to the south of Gerar, the same thing happened. He was again not where he was supposed to be, and again through the circumstances of Abimelech, spoken and says, why didn't you say, this is your wife. God did not speak to him, but spoke to that king. And revealed to the king who Sarah was. Where we find ourselves is that as Abraham moved, we saw like that God now again is to say, go to a place. Again an instruction to a mountain. And then the instruction was, oh, sacrifice your son Isaac, your beloved son, sacrifice And this time, he got up early in the morning, he had no meeting with the mother, because you can just imagine what the mother would have done. That journey would never have taken place. Just took his two servants and the donkey and off he went. And when he got to the mountain, he saw the mountain in the far, he told his servants, this is where you need to stay. Me and the, the son of the boy will go further than this. Leave them behind because they will also interfere. Now let's get to Moriah. This is where the actual calling of Abram comes in. And this is where obedience comes in. You see, sometimes we have selective obedience. 
If God said, sacrifice your son, I don't want to hear anything further. I'm ready. But we know that he prepared everything. The question was asked by Isaac. That he sees everything, but he doesn't see the sacrifice. He says, God will provide. We know that God already provided. So when we got there, we the altar and you. God has tied his son to the altar. Took the knife. The demonstration of the knife is I take everything higher than myself. And I praise you, Lord. That's the principle of Jadar. With my hand, I will praise you. I will take. This is my beloved son. I'm attached to him. But I'm prepared to sever everything that I have. I'm going to separate now the body. Because this is also identification of his country. And he's lifting his hand to give thanks to the Lord. Because now he's in obedience to God. But as he has done that and has proven to God that now I have separated myself from my country. And I'm, and I'm demonstrating it. My soul, we know, consists of the mind and the heart and the will. All of that is conjoined to this body of my son. I am now the father, but I entrust everything to you as my father. You will teach me, because it's according to your will. It's not by might, not by power, but it's by thy spirit. Yes. And at that point in time when he lifted, God spoke again. If his obedience, frequency were not aligned, God would have agreed to child sacrifice. And that's not about God is. He's not a pagan God. Hallelujah. Thank you to Abraham that stepped up his obedience into absolute obedience to the word of God. And when he heard that and he stopped and the instruction is to look around. You see, we, we, we normally don't do that. We are so focused here that we don't see what God wants to show us. Because we're so focused on the calling, sometimes our calling comes from man and not from God. That we call ourselves man of God. So Abraham had to step up from obedience. This is the economy of God. It's a moving economy. You still think you've got it. God passively moves. We talk about passive income. Don't have to do anything. We just we must just roll. In obedience, there's also passive. Obedience, there's, there's, they are crazy. Because where do God wants to bring us to? If it's obedience today, if it's absolute obedience today, He want to bring us ultimately into oneness with Him. The highest form of anything is if I do that. We went to Nels Prater one day. Aubrey would know who I'm talking about. You would meet him next week by Mrs. Sylvester. So I see the son and the father got out of the car and they got dark on in blue shirt. And I tell the one Colleague and said, just look at the two, the father and son. And then, as they, they just open up their feet to get before they walk in the walk, they walk so the same. And I look at it and say, I'm looking at one picture. Ultimately, no son can become a father if he wasn't a son. You need to become a follower before you can become a leader. 
And the way you follow is the way you will lead. If you will not start in deed, you will not be a father in deed. And it's not just in deed, we'll do it now, I mean in deed, in doing the deed. In your deed it will show there is something that's not there. But we need to understand that the movements of God is that your calling is a calling out of your comfort zone. If you are still in your comfort zone, there's a problem. Who will be? And I know people have got a problem when you talk a country as a body. And a country man is just so, we've got so ties as human beings. And sometimes we need to cut off these soul ties. I think you know what I'm talking about. But I want to just confirm in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23. You see, we need to change the order and we need to restructure it again. Because we have a body and we have soul and we have spirit. The spirit is so compressed and suppressed. And I want to tell the church today that in all of our dealings out there, difficult dealings, wise of the world, we are tripartite being, soul, body, and spirit. We always put our bodies on the line. And when the body says, I'm tired, I have to call you back into order. He shows a little bit of an ailment here and there. Because we did not manage it properly. Now 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23 talks about it. And when you, when you read it, it now states that we need to change that order again. To put the spirit first. And the soul and the body. Amen? We need to change it. Because somewhere something went wrong. Somewhere something went wrong. In Ecclesiastes 12 and 7, we say that the dust returned to the earth and the spirit to God who gave it to us. Is we need to understand these orders of what is happening. And we mustn't confuse it. Sometimes it slips just with us not looking or not being careful in our management. It just happens that there again, there comes the body again. And the body takes precedence. And this is what happened to, to Abram. Even when Abram became Abram, the same thing happened. And that's what God called him out again on it. So you need to get it right. And ultimately, ultimately, when he got it right. Now look at when it, got, it came into being, is when the sacrifice of his own took place, of his son. Because now the attachment, when I got the message from my sister, she phoned me first. She said to her, I've got devastating news to the family. And then she was quiet. I put so many names there. I had all of my brothers and sisters there. I, I said to myself, I'm not going to tell whose name I put first. But when I got there, gut wrenching feeling. Everything, you know, your whole world is upside down. You don't know what to tell your sibling. Because we all got children of the same age. And to have that news, and to have that attachment to that person, now we can stand as onlookers, and we can come and embrace. It's very easy to do that. But when you put the Abram and you have to sacrifice on your beloved son Isaac, as a demonstration to what he will be doing on the cross. 
Because that one, let's put it like that, Jesus he did not save. He saved him for us, but did not save him as a sacrifice. Because the risen Christ is ultimately the message that we needed to understand. And all of this is just a development to that point. So that when that eventuates, we know the exchanges that took place at the cross, that we can understand this, but it was all coming from Genesis 1 up until that time when it happened. Now just coming back to the callings that I was talking about, when we look at how was Moses called, Moses was called through the bush, fire, through the eyes, the charismatic way, the attraction of the eye, the burning bush, the colors and coming then to God. But then, now the instruction was, take off your shoes. There's an instruction to that because he could only see the fire, but then couldn't hear the voice. Only when he came close there. It's only when you are close. No man has found Jesus Christ. When I found Jesus Christ, I was saying, no, that never happened like that. Jesus is the one that found you. Isn't it? You are tending to the sheep there. There's a few brothers. And Samuel says, he, is, you want to tell me there's no other brother here? And in walked David. He says, we are not going to sit until he comes. I want, I want you to get the feeling when God calls, there's an urgency in the spirit. There's an urgency in the atmosphere. But we must also just walk behind it, not in front of it. We can walk in it, but not in front of it. Because we need to be careful how you walk in the spirit of God. Because we will make mistakes. And unfortunately, we'll do things that we're waiting for the for God speaking, but we'll speak here. And but God still needs to speak to you. Now look at look at this. Proverbs 25 verse 2. This is the God that I know. He says it is the glory of God to conceal the matter. And it's the honor of kings to search it out. The heavens for height and the earth for depth. These things become unsearchable at the end of the day. But kings, we are kings. We can search it out. But look at look at God. God did, hides the things. And we never go there, we stand here, we heard somebody also look in and say, no, I saw this, there's red and there's blue there. And then we stood here, we never go and look and never go and search, and we just assume it is red and it is blue. Kings search the things out. Because God hides himself in the names of mountains, names of rivers. And when you go and you search these things out, and all of a sudden, wow, I never knew this is what it is. That is who God is because if you read Mark 4, verse 12, sorry, 22, it's, he says that for everything that is hidden will be brought into the open. And every secret, secret will be brought to light. So we are living now in the era that everything will be revealed to us. The secret is, don't die now. There are more things that will be revealed. More greater things will be shown to us. Brother Paul, Apostle Paul, Peter, they are jealous of us. Because remember, they look through a dumb blocks. We see it brightly now. These things are now in fruition. It's happening. 
It's happening. And because of it, the enemy has to create certain things now to cause havoc. He's causing his own vortex to try and suck us up here in the thing. And there's gross darkness and the Bible says that the evil will become even more. The reason for that is, as Brother Obi prayed, the intentional living must now become even more precise. You cannot step into that and say and speak like this. Because the darkness is going to become even gr more gross. It's going to be stark. I don't know what's more than dark and darker. It's going to be dark. The evil is going to be, it's going to be worse. So now you have to know if I call upon your name, I want to know what trumpet are you blasting? What is coming out of your mouth? You cannot appear like the beautiful word, the semblance. You cannot appear to be there, but you say you are this. Because there are people that watch you, that listen what you say, but still looking, when you finish saying it, they still looking. And all of a sudden, you do something else after you spoke. That is what's coming now. Because some of us must stand, stand firm. And the first stand firm, and the scripture says you must stand again. The first stand is for the people. And the last stand is for you. It's the conclusion of the agreement. So Abraham should stand, notwithstanding anything. He's able to argue with God with regard to saving Sodom and Gomorrah. He's negotiating on our behalf. He has now become a friend of this God. And at the end, he must still stand to show that one that is watching, indeed, it was the real man I was looking at. It wasn't a man that stood. And now he's fallen, and at the end of the day, I don't know where he is now. So, I have all my hopes of this man, that he will become the Savior. Remember, Jesus Christ said to his disciples, he says, after this, we told you are the one. You the main things. You are the one. But in the end, it's like, we thought it was him uh, on the road to Emmaus, he gave the account. We thought it was him seven and a half, seven kilometers away from Jerusalem, perfect out of line. You know the name the seven, number seven? You can be in perfect out in perfection. You can perfect your wrong route you take. When the order that was given was to stay in Jerusalem. Now standing there was for them and standing here following Jesus Christ and still standing is for me. And when they look, they see the complete word. And now they know there is indeed a God. And then we found Moses out of the water, thrown out of the water, and had his fall because of the water. Because at the second time it was disobedience. The first time he struck the, the rock, and the second time he had to speak to the rock. The first time is a dispensation where you use the law. You have to use something that's the law to bring you, subject you to obedience. And the second time, it's a different dispensation of grace. How you speak the grace. He didn't understand the movement of God. You see, the calling of God is never what you've learned here. And once we fuss on you hear from Kiris or Sons of Kikri. We've never received the full gospel. God is still speaking. He says, 
For every word that I'm speaking is not by breath alone that a man shall live, but the preceding word is so penetrating the atmosphere. So we must learn, I cannot know. You see, in some stages, he was right when he confronted God by saying, but these are your people, it's not my people. Remember? He came to that balance there. Whose, whose people are these? He says, no, but God, these are not my people, it's your people. It was a test that God gave him. But later, he acted on, he says, I need to get water for these people here. Now he's people again. We need to be consistent. We can never, we can never in our mind try to perceive that this belongs to us. The truth belongs to no man. The truth is the truth. It belongs to no man. But man can actually aspire to receive the truth. And now attach himself to the truth. Because tomorrow, when your idea changed, the truth will still remain. That's the consistency of the truth. And that is the gospel. The gospel remains as it is. But we must, the more you read the word of God, we say we know that the word of God is reading us. And to that point, so don't hinder the children. <laughs> At the end of the day, this is what we are. We all about. We are fighting this whole thing. Joseph of Mary, we understood his calling was like, no, 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 I'm not going to have any part in that. The people said, no, you must be thrown. They said, no, 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 she's, she's pregnant of someone else. Until the Lord spoke to him and said to him, Joseph, and gave him the instruction, you give the child to God. Because that child was not birthed by any, except by my spirit. And he says that child is there to save the nations. How beautiful is that? And from then, God only spoke to Joseph. And somewhere, Joseph just disappeared, and at the cross, he concluded and he said, Mother, son of mother. He fixed that again. We have to understand the accounts of Jesus Christ, how He works this whole thing around, and we need to read into it, it's into this word and try to understand it, how He made everything. He fixed it. He fixed it. But now He had not spoken, they had not spoken, God never spoke to Mary except for pre. that the child will be coming. And then after that she spoke to he spoke to, to, to Joseph. Joseph, go to Egypt, you can read, oh Joseph, you can go, you can come back. And then lastly he says, now I speak, I need to death that was done before I need to fix now. From up here I will fix it. There's nothing, every stitch is perfected. Everyone here today, if you lift your hands up to you and your eyes in your head and you don't even have to investigate your own heart because he's the one that searches the heart. If you do that, you will understand God just need me. Just need me. And ultimately where we will get to is we will get to the truth of the matter that we need to become like the risen Christ. Because that is who He sent. Because this economy of God was gone. So Jesus had to step in. And Christ has to be the one to be the risen one. That's why He's now called Jesus Christ. And then after the cross, He's now Christ Jesus. Because Christ first. If the enemy wants to get to Jesus, he needs to pass Christ. Amen? And if we understand all of that, I like what Paul says, Paul says, I'm not yet dead. But one thing, one thing I've done, and it takes two things. I forget what's behind me, 
and I strive for one. You see, you need to forget. It needs to be one thing. Forget about it and go for it. Otherwise, you're going to be crucifying yourself. Holding on the one thing you need to forget. And striving to the one thing that, you, that He already got for you. And then you crucify yourself. And then crucifixion. This was no more. It's done. The Romans are not in control. God is in control. Amen? Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can gather in this way. It is a time of fellowship. It's a time, O Lord, of dispensing your word. It's a time, O Lord, where we become conversational. Because we are sitting in the presence of the Almighty. You are a God that is, we know your word says, is a present help in time of trouble. We know, Father, that some of our hearts are still aching and paining. We have despair. It is only to your word that can penetrate the Father all darkness. That's why your word is so important. We want to thank you for your ultimate and oneness in the obedience of Abraham. Where you could stop that action as one father because his ear was always pointed to your, your voice, your mouth. And your heart became conjoined with his heart. And that is the fellowship that we can stand today, O Lord, on that platform. And we can just say thank you with great gratitude in our heart and appreciation. For you, O Lord, select and elect anyone. But it is time that we should come into a position of stationary and once again just point our ears to hear the voice of God. There are so many voices, my Father. Let there be a separation as you upskill our listening skill of God. Because it is one of the greatest skills, because without that skill, we can't give advice. We can't even salvage our brothers and sisters. But it is in the knowledge of who you are today, Father, that we can stand with open arms. And we can have the laughter in our mouth called Isaac. And we can speak for the God even when Isaac was quiet. Imagine he had said, Father, what are you doing? I can see now that I am the sacrifice. And that could have influenced Abram's heart and his ability to hear clearly the voice that says, Stop. I thank you, Lord. It's such a privilege. A privilege, Father, that we, we know we don't take lightly. Because we need to speak from a platform and sometimes influence people's lives. But thank you, Father, that we can only do it through the Word. Because ultimately, without the Word, Father, we know that the earth and the heaven shall pass away, but your Word shall stand and remain, Father. And therefore we take comfort in that, that we shall stand, no matter what, in the midst of storms that are raging around us, Father. We thank you, Father. I pray now for each and every one, and even this ministry, is service of the Word, Lord. What a beautiful name, what an appropriate name, O oh God. I thank you. It's a seasonal a seasonal name. Even though it stands for a while of God, it's, it never becomes dated. Because it is linked to that that we are all called for. To speak your word. I pray now, Father God, that an upgrade shall take place in all the ministers of this ministry of Lord. My heart was bleeding when I saw how your deacons serve your people of God with such order. With 
with such peace, so quietly, Father, just doing everything. It's amazing to witness that, Father, and I thank you for that from my heart. So I ask now, Lord, that you will come and just accelerate. Accelerate the fall of God just only as you can. Every need that's in this house, house of God. Every heart that is in this house, Lord, you will come, O Lord, and just keep it in the palm of your hand. And you will inspect it and you will sort it out as one of the best cardiologists and just say, I understand, I will fix it. And nothing will be painful anymore. Because you will know what you know, that He is your God and He is your Father and He cares about you. I thank you Lord. We are entering a season, Father, that so many things are happening around us. When we are in this noble environment of Father, I don't bring in the name of the enemy of Father. I'm not, I'm not the good. I'm not one to try and advocate him or all. But we know he's standing there. And he's, he's not going to enter here, Lord. Because we are here. We stand upon your word. He is our enemies. We're not his friends. And we thank you, Lord, that through the cross, your son has dealt with him. Make a public spectacle of him, or Lord. He's under his feet. So that we can stand free and because we are in the presence of God, your word says there is liberty of heart. And we take that liberty to declare that we are free in your presence of heart. We come now for the God. And you will rest through the power of the Holy Spirit. Rest your spirit upon us. As the Trinity to place that God sent the dove to touch Jesus, the Trinity was established, you call. But Jesus the Son was there, the Holy Spirit in the form of the dove, and God aligned all from the throne of heaven. And that, the Father, is where we take courage, and that's where we take our, our rest from the God. And we place everything at your altar today, and we know that you declare it is finished. And as a result, we can command our spirit to you. Thank you, Father, for everything that you saw. Thank you for this moment. Every time.